The Nintendo Switch has enjoyed tremendous success thanks in part to its enticing blend of portable and console gaming in a single device. But while Nintendo may be the first company to find real success with this idea, it certainly wasn't the first to try. This is the Genesis Nomad, a console handheld hybrid released back in 1995 by Sega. The vision bring console quality Sega Genesis games to a handheld system while still offering the option to enjoy games on a television with multiple players. Sound familiar? As the Switch has proven, the basic idea is brilliant, but as with many of Sega's early schemes, it didn't exactly pan out. Thus, on today's episode of DF Retro, we're examining the Nomad. What went wrong with it? How well does it actually work? And how many of Switch's ideas were realized back in 1995? You ready? Let's dive in. Handheld gaming systems have been around since the late 70s, but it was the Nintendo Game Boy which really helped popularize the concept. With its small 2-bit monochrome screen, interchangeable game packs, and good enough components, the Game Boy offers a near NES-like experience on the go. But Nintendo wasn't the only one that wanted in on this market. NEC, Atari, and Sega all released handheld consoles over the following years, with varying degrees of success, but none really managed to challenge the Game Boy on the sales front. But what if it were possible to bring the complete home console experience with you on the go? This is the idea that would ultimately lead Sega to release the Nomad, a size-reduced version of the Sega Genesis with its own 3.25 inch LCD screen and built-in 6-button controller. In this form, the Nomad offers the full fat console experience on the go. And this was its main selling point, the ability to play 16-bit Sega Genesis carts anywhere. Now, it wasn't the first to bring a console experience to handhelds, of course. The NEC Turbo Express played TurboGrafx-16 games after all, but it was the first to fully support TV play and single system multiplayer. And that's what makes the difference. Which is precisely where the Switch comparison comes in. Like the Nomad, the Switch is designed to provide both portability and a home console experience. Most would agree that Switch got it right, but how close did Sega come to reaching this goal back in 95 with such limited technology at its disposal? To answer this, we have to consider each use case scenario. The Switch offers docked, handheld, and single system multiplayer in a compact shell, and it works. This was Nintendo's goal from the start, but how does the Nomad stack up, and what was Sega really trying to achieve with it? Well, first there's portability. Both the Switch and the Nomad strive to offer gaming on the go with console quality visuals, at least for the respective generations. Thanks to modern technology, the Switch features a massive widescreen LCD display, a thin profile, and a lightweight design. In comparison, the Nomad is bulkier, heavier, and burdened by limitations of its day. Its three and a quarter inch LCD screen, which was generously sized for 1995, is nothing more than a passive matrix LCD. Now, this massively outdated technology exhibits slow response times and an inability to address singular pixels without influencing those around it. Thus, as a result, the screen exhibits severe ghosting and a rather fuzzy image. Worse still, the screen itself relies on composite video, which further reduces picture quality. When you combine severe ghosting with poor image quality, the Nomad really struggles with faster games like Thunder Force 4 or Sonic the Hedgehog, which is kind of a problem for Sega. But when it comes to the portable experience, nothing is more important than battery life. 
The Switch includes an internal lithium-ion rechargeable battery, while the Nomad ships with a power pack designed to accept six AA batteries. Out of the box, battery life is surprisingly comparable, but at least with the Switch you're not chewing through expensive batteries to keep it running. Now, an optional rechargeable battery pack was released for the Nomad, allowing you to keep playing while charging, just like the Switch. And over the years, battery mods have appeared for the Nomad, greatly enhancing battery life. Even still, this is arguably the Nomad's greatest weak point, and a real issue for the system. Beyond this, both systems do feature a 3.5mm headphone output with built-in speakers, but on the Nomad, this is limited to a low-quality mono speaker, thus headphones are a must when played in portable mode. In terms of the portable experience, then both systems get the job done, but it's obvious that technological evolution allows the Switch to overcome the Nomad's weaknesses. These days, not many people would bother with using a Nomad for its original purpose when there are so many easier ways to play Genesis games on the go, but in 1995, it was really cool. But clearly, a high-end portable experience alone wasn't enough. So, what's next? Well, another major feature of the Nintendo Switch is, of course, the option to enjoy single-screen multiplayer gaming on the go without an additional television. Set the console down, grab some controllers, and play away on the Switch's built-in LCD screen. The Nomad offers a similar function by including a secondary controller port. With the Genesis pad connected, two players can team up on a single Nomad for multiplayer gaming. Unfortunately, this configuration doesn't work especially well. The Switch, with its wireless controllers, plastic kickstand, and reasonably large screen is adequate, but with the Nomad, the single player holding the unit will always have an advantage since the screen itself suffers from poor viewing angles. It's also nearly impossible to see the screen when outdoors. Really, this kind of setup just wouldn't be possible with a Nomad. Lastly, there's the console experience, and this is ultimately what sets both the Nomad and the Switch apart from the pack. The Switch is a great machine capable of delivering visuals exceeding Nintendo's previous generation console. Portability has an impact on its overall capabilities, of course, but it's still reasonably competitive given its form factor. The Nomad, on the other hand, is a Sega Genesis at its heart, a console which had been on the market since the late 80s. Despite this, Sega's 16-bit console still offered a presentation far exceeding any handheld before it. In 1995, the Genesis could conceivably have been compared to the Wii U in 2017. Both were somewhat outdated during these respective periods, but it was nonetheless amazing to see that level of visual quality in a mobile format. Curiously, the Nomad itself is a continuation of the MegaJet concept, a portable Mega Drive console that still requires a TV connection and external power. It was released only in Japan and originally intended for use on airplanes. Sound familiar? The key to this hybrid design is the connection to a television, and both the Switch and the Nomad support this feature straight away. The Switch uses HDMI and is designed for modern flat panels, while the Nomad relies on a 9-pin connector capable of outputting crystal clear RGB video. Unlike the Switch, however, Sega made the mistake of not including video cables in the box. A misstep, perhaps? I think so. But due to its short life, there's only one revision of the Nomad, and its video output is pretty good. There exists a huge variation in video quality across the entire Mega Drive and Genesis line of consoles, but the Nomad manages to stack up against the better units. Jail bars, a common problem with certain revisions of the system, in which vertical lines are visible in solid colors, are slightly visible here, but ultimately better than most other units. I was genuinely surprised when I actually compared the Nomad with two of my other Genesis systems. I have both a Model 1 unit with the high definition graphics label on the top and a Model 2 with a 32X connected. Both of them look pretty good, but the Nomad produces a brighter overall image. The Model 2 with 32X produces the lowest number of visible jail bars, but the Model 1 is kind of dim in comparison with plenty of visible jail bars. Audio is good too. It's punchy and lacks the muffled output exhibited by certain revisions of the Mega Drive console. Of course, 
when it comes to using each machine with a TV, the Switch concept offers a significant advantage in the form of its dock. Cable management is not required here beyond the initial setup. Simply drop your Switch into its dock and it appears on your TV. You can then sit back and relax with a variety of different wireless controllers. With the Nomad, however, you'll need to directly connect the system to your television using a video cable. And if you wish to save batteries, a separate AC adapter is also a must. With everything connected then, it's bulky and impractical. You'll need to sit relatively close to the screen as well, and once again, two-player support is somewhat limited. This is perhaps the area where the Nomad falls furthest. While it may be a portable Genesis at its heart, Using it as a console isn't really a great experience. Now, the solution to this seems somewhat obvious in retrospect. Basically, if a controller port were included along with an option to toggle between controller or onboard controls, the Nomad could absolutely have matched a real console. But as it is, it's not great, at least without mods, which we'll get to in a second. In addition, I think the inclusion of wireless controllers could have really worked here. While typically powered by infrared or radio frequency signals, wireless controllers did exist during this period. In fact, Sega itself released a set of IR pads for the Genesis that might have paired up nicely with the Nomad. So how about actual compatibility? Obviously the Switch works with every Switch game, but with the Nomad it's based on another console that had come well before it. In this case, the Nomad's hardware is based on the second revision of the Genesis, rather than the Majesco-produced Genesis 3. That means it offers excellent compatibility and supports nearly every game for the system. This includes titles such as Virtua Racing with a special SVP chip. Some people have suggested that it doesn't work with the Nomad, but as you can see here, it works without a problem. This is a game that doesn't work with the Genesis 3, but it looks awesome on the Nomad. In fact, playing any sort of 3D polygonal game on a portable system in 1995 was kind of a revelation. There's also a number of different games which don't support the embedded 6 button pad, but holding the mode button while booting the system solves this problem straight away by booting the system in 3 button mode. There is one other game which isn't fully compatible with the Nomad, and that is X-Men. At a certain point in the game, you have to reboot the system basically, which literally means pressing the reset button on your Genesis. And since the Nomad lacks a reset button, well, you can't play any further. And the add-ons? Well, theoretically, the 32X and Sega CD could function with the Nomad hardware. Neither fit the system by default, and the necessary connections are missing, making it impossible to use them out of the box. Though, if you're feeling kind of crazy, you could try something like this. I don't really recommend it. The Nomad, though, is highly moddable, and there are a lot of people out there that have managed to pair the Nomad with each of these add-ons. There's also various screen mods out there, mods which allow you to use the controller port for single-player games, and more. Basically, thanks to the work of the community, the Nomad has been expanded well beyond its original form. It's a great machine these days. The Nomad as it appeared in 1995, then, is an interesting system. In many ways, it lives up to its promises. You can indeed play Genesis games on the go. It can be enjoyed on a TV, and it supports multiplayer on a single system, but ultimately the hardware just wasn't ready. The main issue here really comes down to battery life. Unlike most modern systems, the Nomad didn't even include batteries or an AC adapter in the box, requiring additional investment up front. So while it's true that battery life is somewhat comparable to the Nintendo Switch on paper, it's important to remember that the Switch includes a rechargeable battery and the power adapter right in the box. The Nomad and the game carts are also somewhat large to be fully portable, and the system is barely usable outdoors, which kind of defeats the purpose, right? It's a neat gimmick, but for 180 bucks in 1995, it was kind of a tough sell, and thus it faded into obscurity. In the wake of the Nomad, however, it took nearly a decade before another company would attempt to push the boundaries of handheld gaming again. In the following years, Nintendo would update its Game Boy line to include Game Boy Color and the excellent Game Boy Advance, but neither really pushed the limits of handheld technology at the time. The Neo Geo Pocket Color is another great little system that followed the Game Boy mold of sticking with simple and cheap components to keep the price down and battery life up. The same goes 
for the Wonderswan from Bandai. This device, released only in Japan, saw moderate success and was in fact the creation of Gunpei Yokoi, father of the Game Boy, and he applied the same principles in creating the Wonderswan. But in 2004, Sony unleashed the PSP, which did indeed push the hardware envelope and managed to find reasonable success in the process. But here's the weird part. Late in the system's life, a digital-only model known as the PSP Go was released. It was mostly ridiculed on the internet and ultimately failed, but there's a lot of hidden potential here. It's a great little machine. So what separates it from the other models then? Well, simple, the dock. You can drop the PSP Go in a dock, pair the system with a DualShock 3, and proceed to play games on your TV. Kinda like the Nintendo Switch, right? The Go is basically a micro console which plays both PSP games and PlayStation 1 games at a proper 240p, just like the real thing. So how do you actually connect it to your TV then? Well, since the PSP Go is from 2009, you use component video cables. It supports several video modes, including 480i, 480p, and 240p for PlayStation 1 content. The image sent to the TV is surrounded by black borders, but if you're using an upscaling unit like the Framemeister, or have a TV with custom scaling options, you can solve that issue and enjoy PSP games at near full screen. Then when you're done, simply pull the system off the dock and you're good to go. It even has this cool sliding mechanism that I quite enjoy using. While it lacks the multiplayer aspect of the Switch and the Nomad, and eliminated support for physical media, namely the UMD, the docking system worked super well, and it's a shame Sony did not attempt to expand upon this with the Vita. Perhaps it could have found a greater success there. Either way, I've always felt that this feature was hugely overlooked, and with jailbroken firmware, the PSP Go is a great little travel console. But as we've examined in this video, many of these ideas stem from the Nomad. From hybrid consoles to motion controls, all the way to online play and beyond, Sega certainly had a knack for introducing new features before the industry was really ready. The Nomad is one of those products, and it exhibits the same types of faults. It works, but not quite well enough for the average consumer. You have to put up with a lot. Believe it or not, during its development, there were even more ambitious plans in the works, including a potential touchscreen, but ultimately the Nomad is what we received and what will go down in history as Sega's last major handheld console. And no, the VMU does not count. But with that, we've come to the end of another episode. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at the Nomad, and if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring that little bell up there to receive updates from our channel. It certainly helps make content like this possible. And if you want to say hello, be sure to find us over on Twitter. But until next time, stay retro.